Hi everyone, and welcome to Fit for Fellowship, a survival guide for the first year general cardiology fellow. I'm Megan. I'm Stacy, and welcome back. And today we have a lecture from Dr. Nigel Gupta from Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center, and uh, he worked on his talk together with cardiology fellow uh, Franz Schweiss. And so um, I'm going to provide an introduction for them before we get started on their talk about ablation complications. So Dr. Nigel Gupta, uh, he received his medical degree from University of California, Irvine in California, and received his bachelor's of science degree from University of San Diego. Uh, Dr. Gupta is a cardiac electrophysiologist and the director of the cardiac uh, electrophysiology team at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center. His team provides electrophysiology care for the entire Kaiser Permanente Southern California region, which includes 11 uh, Kaiser Permanente medical centers. He is principal investigator for clinical trials, and his clinical trials participation includes a worldwide trial to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of a left atrial appendage closure device for patients with AFib, and a trial evaluating the safety and performance of the ventricular defibrillation leads. Dr. Gupta is also an investigator in the federally funded National Cardiovascular Registry, Cardiovascular Research Network, ICD, uh, the registry project. And his clinical areas of interest include cardiac electrophysiology, arrhythmia research, and clinical trials and fellowship teaching. And Dr. Franz Schweiss, he is a general cardiology fellow at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center. He is currently a third year fellow. And he obtained his undergraduate degree at the University of California, San Diego. He completed medical school at State University of New York Downstate Medical Center College of Medicine. And then he went on to do his internal medicine residency training at the University of California, San Diego. So without further ado, uh, we will let them give their talk. Hi, my name is Nigel Gupta. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist at Kaiser Los Angeles. I once was a cardiology fellow and we all have our internal ways of asking for help, but I think this is great to have an electronic version and I hope that this helps. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Make sure I do this right. So we were assigned the topic of uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices, which are called CID and ablation complications. I wanna thank our chief fellow, uh, Franz, for his help in developing these slides. And I must say, uh, at first we were a little bit um, taken aback by why are we talking about complications and um, it, do we get a lot of complications? We do a lot of procedures. So of course we're going to see complications. And uh, this is a plug for any of you that might be interested in EP, uh, and even if you're not, because I wasn't when I was a first year fellow, uh, we do a lot of procedures here uh, like you do at your institutions, almost uh, a thousand at one point uh, CIEDs or devices, uh, pacemakers and defibrillators, and almost a thousand ablations a year. So it's inevitable that there will be complications. You're entering a procedural specialty and it comes with the territory, uh, so to speak. Uh, so I think the objectives though, are to be able to recognize these complications, right? Um, a complication isn't the end of the world if they are recognized and treated uh, in a timely fashion. And so that's the objective of this talk is to show you different scenarios and help you uh, recognize them, but also to really um, hopefully suggest some uh, practical solutions uh, that may work for you. Um, and most importantly, perhaps some of the cases here will uh, uh, um, remind you uh, as, a, as a tool for when to ask for help. Okay, so where should we start? Well, how about what do we consent patients for when we um, are talking to them about a procedure? What are the complications that we consent for? So there's always, bleeding and infection, and the list goes on and on. Sometimes we just do this long list and we think it will never happen, but we always have to be prepared uh, that it could happen and it could be uh, presenting to you in the emergency room as a first year cardiology fellow. I think the most common ones that we would like to focus on that you might see and I saw as a cardiology fellow are these following categories. So obviously uh, implanting a device can lead to pneumothorax, bleeding, infection, uh, perforation, a lead dislodgement. And then I'd like to focus a little bit on device malfunction. It's, it's in quotes because it's not really 
procedural related, but now the patient has a device and it's not uncommon for the fellow to be the first to be called for a, a real or a perceived device malfunction. So we'll get into that. So let's start with this one. Um, this was a real case and uh, you know, this is the baseline x-ray over here. And the fellow called us, you know, the next day actually after the procedure said the x-ray was okay. Now in the fellow's defense, I will tell you right before giving this talk, I called my EP fellow in, um, who's done a lot of these, and he's our senior fellow, and I said, let me make sure I got this right. Uh, is, this, <laughs> is this the pneumothorax? Because it can be subtle, and you, you, you really wouldn't look usually down here. You would think of about looking at where the device is placed at the apex of the heart. Uh, but if I zoom in, which uh, let's see if I can do that on this version here, you can probably see here that there's significantly a, um, well, this doesn't really show very well, so let me go back. But if you compare here, there's markings here and there's a paucity here uh, of um, lung markings. You know, the point is not to be over-concerned, but not to miss it. I, I remember we had a fellow once who walked around um, when we didn't have digital x-rays with the x-rays, with every case worried about a pneumothorax. Uh, you just have to know when to think about it and ask for help. Talk to your radiology colleagues, talk to a senior uh, uh, fellow and take a look. Uh, and um, it can be difficult, but the treatment um, you should be ready to use uh, uh, and be able to, um, after you identify the pneumothorax. So, um, you know, it usually incur occurs um, because uh, the vasculature can be close to the apex. Uh, on that note, um, it's much more common with a subclavian vein access versus what we call an extra thoracic stick. So looking at the operative note can be helpful. If you know your implanter in your um, cardiology group or EP group tends to only do extra thoracic access, specifically a cephalic cut down, the chance of a pneumothorax or even a hemothorax when it's extra thoracic is very, very low and really not high on your differential. Although, you know, Never say never. Um, and the treatment is probably, you know this better than we do, what you experienced in, um, in, in medicine uh, uh, residency um, is to find your colleagues that know how to put a chest tube in. That could be anyone from the implanter uh, to a cardiac surgeon to interventional radiology. Uh, and to buy time, I've often you know, seen the fellows order high flow oxygen and that's sometimes been a recommendation even for um, uh, small uh, pneumothoraces. So, um, you know, uh, not, nothing new that you're not used to seeing uh, from residency, but uh, that suspicion should be there, as well as the symptoms of a pneumothorax, which we didn't really get into, but we'll discuss in a little bit here. Um, so let's move to a uh, pocket hematoma. And this seems pretty straightforward, but I'll probably highlight some things that may be new to you that um, uh, you didn't really know in, in medicine residency, nor should you be expected. So obviously it's more common with uh, antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation uh, therapy, but believe it or not, most procedures now are done on un uninterrupted Coumadin uh, and even DOAC. So although we tend to stop our DOAC for one dose, and the reason why is that there are studies now that have shown that you actually get decreased uh, device um, uh, uh, hematomas in the pocket with uninterrupted anticoagulation. So don't immediately blame the implanter for not having stopped anticoagulation. But there are ways to prevent it. Definitely avoiding IV uh, heparin or uh, Lobinox. I think that's a big risk for a hematoma. If you can, which is difficult, you know, triple antithrombotics, but uh, we, you know, you'll learn during your cardiology fellowship with drug eluting stents, et cetera, that you really should be careful stopping these sometimes as well. And along that line, you know, the initial first um, step could be stopping the anticoagulation or reversing it for hematoma, which makes a lot of sense. The important point here is that in these patients, they are, um, uh, cardiac patients, so they may have had a recent cardioversion, right? And so now they're on anticoagulation to prevent a stroke. It's very unlikely to die from a hematoma, but we have seen cases that were acutely reversed for a small hematoma, and then the patient develops a complication for why they were on that blood thinner to begin with. So just think carefully before reversing, especially if it's a small hematoma. 
And to treat it, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's usually just some mechanical compression, even 10 minutes, you know, especially if the device is just swollen up patient says it was fine, it was fine, and it just acutely, you know, become, became swollen, the hematoma itself will probably uh, auto-compress and tamponade that area, but some manual pressure bedside by the nurse with ice packs is often what we recommend. Now, I crossed out evacuation so that you don't have that on your list of things to do. It's very rare that we have to do this, but, uh, you know, once you get into the pocket, it's, you know, it's considered a dirty pocket and an infected device. So uh, different locations may have different techniques. In general, we try to refrain from opening the pocket. And if we do so, then we do it in a very controlled environment. Let's say we have to stop a bleeder or there's significant pain, uh, then we will uh, take the patient back to the procedural uh, area uh, to evacuate that. And then last but not least, you know, uh, device hematomas can actually look worse uh, before they look better. And uh, so here's an example. I mean, you know, the patient's arms completely bruised and you guys, if you've ever had a Charlie horse, you know that this can happen to you too. It just absorbs and the blood has nowhere to go. So I always tell the patient, it's going to look worse before it looks better. And, um, you know, this was a standard uh, pocket hematoma, not ours, but we've had our share. Uh, that I took from this nice review article, by the way, that goes over cardiac pacing uh, and all features of it, if you have a chance to take a look at that. So what about this one? If this one is, if this patient came in with pain, you know, I might think as a first year fellow, well, that doesn't look nearly as bad as the first one. But in all honesty, um, here, um, I would say that um, uh, the concern here is that there is some erythema. And in fact, that this is a sign of an early infection. And so infection on devices is something to, you know, take care of uh, uh, cautiously because uh, now it can get into the bloodstream, right? So it starts at the pocket, but it's a very difficult thing to, to sterilize. And um, it's rare in the first week. In general, if a patient even goes home and has a fever in a day or two and some redness, it's very rare to get an infection that quickly. We give pre implant IV antibiotics, and uh, some people use them to go home with, but the data really is strong for, you know, the pre-IV antibiotic, uh, pre-incision antibiotics. And um, if the patient has some kind of redness right afterwards, just think about other non-infectious etiologies before you call the surgeons or you call the implanter to uh, re you know, extract the device. Reasons why it could have happened could be a retained suture. So that's a good thing to look at. We discussed hematoma. Hematoma actually can predispose to uh, an infection. And basic things to do are, you know, um, consider blood cultures. Um, you know, you can up the game on antibiotics. Although if you're starting to do this, relying on an infected pocket getting better with antibiotics is very rare, except if it's very superficial. And talk to the implanter, talk to your local ID doc. Um, but if it really is infected, there's no way around it uh, except to uh, extract everything, all the devices. And, um, you know, uh, th that's probably a separate talk about how we plan that. So that might be some scenarios that you have uh, for infections. Um, and uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is cardiac perforation. So again, you might be hearing about this um, from your other talks, but um, it's a very rare complication, I'll say. Uh, about one out of 200 probably sounds about right, um, if not less. And the patient can present with a variety of symptoms, obviously, from the pericarditis symptoms to uh, classic hypotension um, and uh, Specifically, perforation from a device, though, if the lead is causing the perforation, then um, can cause symptoms from the lead. So if it's capturing not the heart and pacing the diaphragm, they'll have hiccups. Um, one way you can test if there's a perforation, if you're not sure, the thresholds will be up, but you'll learn that pacemaker leads have two poles on them. And when there's two poles on them, usually it captures better from the tip in the heart rather than from the ring. Well, if you pace unipolar from the tip, it's the one scenario where you might find that it's worse thresholds because that tip is what's sticking out of the heart. So that's a clinical pearl. If you're not sure if the lead is perked or not, 
So, you know, don't forget to check the thresholds as part of your differential, do unipolar pacing, do intentional high output pacing, like 10 volts. And if you start capturing extra thoracic muscle twitching diaphragm, or they have more pain, then that's a higher suspicion for a um, perforation um, if you're on the fence. Some people use cardiac CT. I'll tell you that it has not been very helpful for us um, only because um, there's so much reverberation on the tip of the lead. And if it's already close to the you know, tip of the heart, it's hard to rely just on that. So um, you know, if there's tamponade, uh, Obviously, it's emergent pericardiocentesis, and the ultimate uh, fix is a lead revision. Here's another clinical pearl that we practice at our institution, and I'm not sure how you do it at yours. If the patient is on anticoagulation, like I mentioned, um, and it's an acute bleed, uh, especially intraprocedurally or right after the procedure, if it's a big enough effusion, we tend to stick pericardial access first. Uh, I know that sounds crazy. What if you hit something else and you make bleeding worse? If it's a big enough effusion that's rare and you can do an ultrasound guided bedside, you can do a fluoroscopically guided in your uh, cath or EP lab. So learn the different techniques to do it. Um, uh, this is not a talk on pericardiocentesis and I'm sure you'll have talks on how to do those. But the reason why we don't reverse anticoagulation is that if it's really acute blood in there, and it's growing rapidly, we've had cases where once we've got in, gotten in, it's all clotted off. And now there's still tamponade and the patient now has to go to the operating room because we cannot remove the fluid. So uh, discuss it with your group at your uh, institution if that's their practice as well. But that definitely has become our practice here, maybe more acutely if the bleed happens during the actual procedure, which you might not be involved in, but something to consider. Okay. So let's get to what's the fun part for me um, and the malfunctions on a device. And let me try to keep it very simple and top scenarios for a cardiology fellow. So a pacemaker, you know, for you is you want a rhythm. So what if you see spikes, but new, no QRS, right? They're gonna have bradycardia. So that's a risk. And what is that? What do you do then? But what if you don't see the spikes and no QRS. They still have Brady, but it's different whether or not you see spikes. And then the bonus one we'll get into, this might be for the second and third year fellows, but it can happen to you and the patient come to the ER. What if you see too many spikes and the patient's pacing way faster than you know their base rate of 60 and they're tachycardic? How do you stop that? On an ICD, it's a little bit different. The scenarios that could come into an ER, but you're going to see this you're going to see a patient coming in front of you complaining of shocks and will start to have shocks, but they're not in an arrhythmia. What do you do? What's the cause of that? Or the opposite, they're coming in in VT and they're not getting shocks. And you, in fact, as a first year fellow think, well, if they're not shocking, then they must not be in VT. But I'll tell you one thing, you are always smarter than the device. If you think it is VT, it is VT. Uh, and shock the patient externally, which is obviously the treatment. So what are the terminology for why this happens? So just a little bit of teaching, just to uh, teach a little EP here. Uh, if you see spikes but no QRS, you need a higher output. I think that that's pretty intuitive. What might not be intuitive to uh, a first year cardiology fellow who hasn't studied pacemakers is always think of a pacemaker as being told not when to pace, but when not to pace. A pacemaker always wants to pace until it sees something and says, okay, I'll hold off. I'm going to pace until I see something and it holds off. So in general, a pacemaker is being told when not to pace. And can you imagine if it saw things that didn't really exist, it wouldn't pace. That's called oversensing, overseeing. Then it doesn't pace and you get bradycardia. So what would you do for a pacemaker that's oversensing something that's not really happening, which we'll talk about? The rare scenario is that dual chamber pacemakers are told when to pace, right? Because the atrium wants to tell the ventricle to pace. And so that can lead to this bonus question uh, issue where patients pace too fast because they're over tracking something. And so we'll get into that. Now on an ICD, think about it the same way. What if you sense a bunch of stuff in a defibrillator that's not there? What is the device going to think? It's going to think it's VF, 
So you're not worried about the pacing as much, although it will inhibit pacing. And it, especially if the patient's pacer dependent with a defibrillator, now you've got a double whammy. They'll stop pacing and they'll get a shock. In fact, if a patient who's pacer dependent is getting a shock and they said they passed out with an ICD, that doesn't mean it was VF because it could be over sensing. They were pacer dependent. It stopped pacing and it shocked them. So you still have to check the device. And then last but not least, we talked about a scenario where what if you um, a patient is in VT but not getting shocked, so it's under sensing. So let's look at it a little differently. A pacemaker, um, if it under senses, then it will overpace, meaning if it doesn't see that there's a true rhythm, it'll pace right through it. That's not a big deal, okay? It's over sensing that will cause it to underpace and is a big deal. However, for an ICD, if it undersenses, it won't treat VT and it's a big deal. And if it oversenses, it will shock. Complicated, let's, let's basically uh, simplify it as much as we can here. So if you are undersensing, okay, you might have to just change the programming with a programmer. You need to make the device more sensitive. You need to change what we call the sensitivity or the R waves to make them be able to see things that are smaller. Um, for an ICD, it could also mean the reason it's not treating VT is the VT is 150 beats a minute, but I program the VT at 170, right? So you need to change the zone. Now, oversensing is an issue usually where the device is seeing non-physiologic electrograms, even though you don't see them. And that could be anything from a fracture on the lead to it seeing another channel, uh, seeing a T wave, a far P wave, or um, electromagnetic interference. And we'll get a little bit uh, into that. So um, what's the treatment? Okay, like Dr. Gupta, save that for an EP lecture. What's the practical treatment? And I think that this one, do a time check here. This one is um, probably the take home slide a magnet, you see magnet on both. Usually a magnet will take care of both things, right? Because if it's over sensing, a magnet will change it to asynchronous and start to pace. And if it's over sensing on an ICD, it will turn off sensing and, um, I'm sorry, it'll turn off therapies. Now, the important points is that it does nothing to pacing on an ICD. So they could still end up having asystole from over sensing. And that point you have to grab the programmer. The only other point I want to mention is just treat the patient, right? So if they're not pacing and you don't have a magnet, you don't know how to use a programmer, stick on the pads and pace them, right? If you grab the programmer and you don't know how to use them, there's a red button on there. Push the red button. Um, for a pacemaker, it will pace. And for an ICD, it will shock. Uh, for an ICD, again, you know, if it's under sensing, um, you have to know how to do cardioversion. Obviously, you all know how to do that from ACLS. So you treat the patient and you do that, okay? So here's an example. Um, this is not true sensing. This is from a bovi. So a bovi creates noise. No big deal. They have a pressure. It creates noise. Look at this. It inhibits the pacemaker. Can you imagine if this noise were on the lead inside the body for whatever reason? A broken lead can look this way. EMI can look this way. Here's an ICD. Not only does it over sense noise, this happened to be during a Mohs procedure, but you know, it could be at home. I had this happen to a patient when they were igniting an oven um, and there was EMI. It even shocked them when it wasn't supposed to. And you can see they're pretty much in a slow rhythm. And so this is what a magnet looks like. It's a donut and uh, most emergency rooms will have this. Um, I was the geek as an F cards fellow and it was uh, on my uh, metal cabinet. I kept one with me. Uh, do not keep it next to your iPhone. Uh, I did not have an iPhone or a phone well, when I was a fellow. Um, so uh, what a magnet does is that it basically changes it to asynchronous. So you see, this is a normal pacemaker. It's pacing, it's pacing, it sees a QRS, it says, I'm going to stop and it paces, it sees it's gonna stop here, it paces right on through, okay? Uh, don't worry about pacing on T waves, it's another discussion. It's probably not enough energy to cause harm, uh, but um, that's what a magnet does. So real quick, a magnet changes it to asynchronous and paces no matter what, but on an ICD, 
It'll turn off inappropriate shocks, but it will not help with the um, pacing. So don't forget the difference between a pacemaker and a um, an ICD. Okay. Uh, how about this bonus question? What if a patient is passing out? They have a pacemaker and they're dependent, and uh, they come into the ER for a check. You check their device, and it's normal. The sensing, the thresholds. What should you check for? So this is a common check for a cards fellow. Syncope with a brand new device and they're in the ER and everything looks good. In fact, you even check for high rate arrhythmias. So that's another thing to do, which is basically make sure there wasn't a VT event. You make sure that it's actually turned on. You check that and it's fine. You know, uh, may really check and, you know, make sure if the patient is dependent or if they had a recent generator change, even with a normal check, something can be happening. So here's a classic example. Uh, this was one of our cases, a patient came in, brand new device, pacer dependent, perfect check, went home, came back in with this. So what happened? Why, why, why did this happen on their home telemetry when they had a perfect check? Well, what did we forget to do during that emergency room check? We forgot to try to create noise. So what you should try to do in a dependent patient is still do maneuvers to create noise. So we call those isometric uh, maneuvers or bedside maneuvers. And you can do things like pocket manipulation. I don't know if you get my camera shown. Um, the real common things I do is I have them pull uh, on their uh, hands like this. I have them push towards me and they push, push, push. I go like this and I have them pull towards me and try to create uh, uh, noise on the lead. Now they might have a system in front of you. So you got to tell them to stop. Um, and or have a programmer there, but it's better than sending them home. And uh, one more thing, um, deep breathing. Uh, you know, believe it or not, I had a patient who was passing out. I couldn't figure out why. And I said, well, what are you doing when you pass out? And he said he had, was howling. Yeah, believe it or not, the guy liked to howl in the evenings. Uh, say no more, but he did it right in front of me and he started to have flatline. I told him to stop. So he was over sensing uh, diaphragmatic potentials. Um, so interesting case. Okay, um, this case, uh, I'm going to um, not pick on our first year cardiology fellow, who hopefully you've met because she's fantastic as Serena, but she gave me a great case, and this is a hard one. She uh, texted uh, last week, I was on call, Dr. Latif, who's our EP hospitalist, can I get help with a patient in ED10? He's pacing at 120 beats a minute and in distress, right? So that's a fast rhythm. We haven't talked about that. And I said, Serena, uh, you know, rather than coming to help her, um, I was like, you gave me a good case for the ACC lecture. Um, and okay. I said, could Here's be, information for Serena no, no, okay, there goes Siri. Um, and, um, you know, um, could it be PMT? So what if a pacemaker is pacing too fast? This was that EKG and uh, gotta love technology, right? Um, this is that EKG and it's pacing fast. So remember, I told you that a pacemaker can pace fast if it's told to pace fast. Just think of it most likely that it's seeing something in the atrium that's fast and now it's tracking it. It can be a true atrial rhythm or it could be something that is called PMT. And remember a pacemaker is sensing the top and telling the bottom to pace. Well, what if there's some kind of rhythm like a PVC that goes back to the A this sees the A that tells the V to pace and that goes back to the A because sometimes you can have VA conduction and you get into what's called an endless loop. So that's pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Both of those can happen and you have to change the pacemaker into a non-tracking mode, which will then um, 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 break the vicious cycle. Change it to like a, a, a non-tracking mode, like almost a single chamber uh, pacemaker and then it won't track the atrium anymore. So, you know, the most common scenario you might see is if you're doing a threshold test. So this is important. Say you're doing an atrial threshold test in the ER and here you see we're pacing, pacing, and then we come down to 0.5 volts. When I give an A pace, this A pace doesn't capture the A. See this A pace, it captured the A, it captured the A because I'm below threshold, no big deal. I stopped my test, but now all the V pacings had 
given a retrograde A that was seen by the lead. So it decided to paste the V, which then decided to give a retrograde A, which decided to paste the V, which, and then go, there you go, you take off PMT. How do you break this? So you're, you caused this. You were doing an atrial threshold test and the patient all of a sudden is pacing a fast rhythm. It's not sinus tack being tracked. It's not an ATAC being tracked, but it's a PMT. And even the device recognized it um, because a PMT can be at the maximum track rate. And what the device did, it says, okay, let me try not to, you know, I'm pacing and pacing. I see this one, but I'm not going to V pace. Maybe I really need to atrial pace and capture this time. And it breaks the cycle. What you can do, and this is a nice summary slide that I actually stole, is just use a magnet. So all of these can be terminated with a magnet. AFib being tracked, making the pacemaker go faster. A sensor-induced tachycardia, like a vibration, and the, it thinks that the patient is moving, and that can cause um, the... Um, that can cause the, um, I'm just making sure I'm um, recording here. I think I am. Oh, uh, yes, I am. Um, and uh, that can cause the um, uh, a heart rate to go fast and then a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Uh, and this just goes over again uh, a couple points that we already mentioned. Okay, let me get into some practical advice right now. Um, you might be overwhelmed saying, how am I going to learn all this? I'm just going to call the rep, right? That's what I thought. Well, what if there is really no rep to help? And uh, you probably saw my little sign here, VTAC. VTAC, you're like, why did he spell it like that? That's not ventricular tachycardia. For me, it's virtual total arrhythmia care. It's a passion of mine. And there's so many ways to do arrhythmia care virtually. You could just pick up your iPhone. And that's what I did with uh, Ara. I think Ara was my first year fellow then. And he called me from the ER and he caught me running actually. So I got caught on call, taking a break. And I said, Ara, we're not supposed to do this, but get, get your iPhone because we got to help this guy who's getting, I think, inappropriate therapies for T-wave oversensing. And uh, so we went through the program where we actually called in the rep who also was uh, out. Uh, we made sure he pulled over and we reprogrammed this Medtronic device and I got patient consent and we took care of him. Well, there's actually different ways to do this now. So check with your electrophysiologists in your areas if they've got all the newest technology like with Medtronic, with Biotronic even has a version of this, as does um, Boston Scientific, which I'm going to show you theirs right now. Their new programmers, you can even call the rep. And so here's an example here at, where I actually, uh, I had it set up to call me and uh, this is my computer at work and my phone rings and boom, I'm looking at a programmer in the ER. And what you'll see is uh, that's me, I'm talking to the rep who's in the room there. Uh, this is another view of it. So I was actually at home. This was the height of the pandemic. Dr. Wu was testing it for me. He was in the in, in the EO, in the uh, OR. And they can walk you through the programmer. You can see they can video conference you. They can annotate. Um, Boston Scientific has this. Medtronic has a version of this on their old programmers. And uh, Biotronic is trialing one as well. So uh, just develop a way to help troubleshoot. There's not always going to be a rep available. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a lot of technology in these devices that I'm passionate about that can help you do things virtually. Not quite enough technology yet. Um, maybe, maybe, um, maybe down the road, um, it'll have that much technology. Okay, let's jump to, I'm doing a time check here, and I think um, we should be perfect on time. Let's jump to ablations. And this is actually a little bit easier, I think, in the sense that most of it has to do with um, standard catheterization complications that you, you're going to hear in other talks as well um, from the plumbers in the group, uh, how to um, manage catheter complications. So um, things like tamponade. Okay, obviously we can have tamponade. Uh, again, if we have tamponade from an ablation, most likely uh, with our AFib patients, especially they're on anticoagulation. So think twice about reversing. I mean, if you have to reverse, reverse, but call the proceduralist. Uh, now we're talking obviously about groin access complications and um, uh, risk complications from anesthesia, et cetera. 
Um, specifically, uh, left atrial appendage uh, occlusion, which I don't get too much into. The only added uh, thing to think about is obviously the patients had left atrial appendage manipulation. A stroke is in the differential. Embolus of the device is extremely rare. Um, one way you can do a quick check is an x-ray. And uh, I tend to fluoro save uh, all my final images of the um, Watchman implant uh, in an AP view so that if the patient came to an ER and there was suspicion, they could look at that. But specific to ablation that's different than other cath procedures that you may see in the ER from an ablation procedure is heart block. Uh, very rare, but if someone had a tough AV NRT or a tough bypass, tra bypass track by the AV node, that could be uh, one thing that could happen. Um, another one is a recurrence of arrhythmia. And believe it or not, some of the procedures we do can cause a patient to be worse if it recurs, because now you've slowed the circuit down just enough that where it used to go so fast that it blocked down the AV node two to one, right? What's a flutter two to one, like 120 beats per minute. If I slow that flutter from 240 beats a minute, but it comes back now at 180 beats a minute because it's injured, it's going to conduct one to one. So they can sometimes feel worse. Uh, other things with uh, ablation can be pericarditis, and don't forget to check for an effusion there. Um, our procedures used to be used to be one of the highest for fluoroscopy, and so a skin burn either from an ablation or even a device actually like a long IV is something to have in your differential. But it's uh, I, I said used to be because on the ablation side we're using a lot of three-dimensional mapping now. And so uh, that risk is a lot low. Our patients are going to have a troponin bump when we ablate. It's intentional. So, you know, be careful and cautious uh, treating this. I don't want to say don't ever check it. Um, ischemic events from procedures could happen from an embolus, so, but you have to check the symptoms and the EKG, obviously, to be sure that uh, that's what's going on. Uh, we just had one of these, um, very rare, but I was on call this weekend and we had a PE. Uh, in fact, it was a, a complication after we had to hold blood thinners because the patient had a bleed first. We held her blood thinner. She's in high risk AFib patients and sure enough, she had a PE. So that's always in the differential. We're manipulating the groin. The patients are kind of bedridden, especially after a complication, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, and then I would like to focus specifically, though, on a few key things for AFib ablations only. I should have put an image here, what we do for AFib ablations, but um, if you don't know yet, um, and if the camera shows, you know, we go into the left atrium, and then we burn around the, around the uh, pulmonary veins. That's the way we do um, an AFib ablation. And so when we're in the left atrium around the pulmonary veins, there's a few things that specifically can happen. Uh, and the patient could come to the ER. So some of them are the same. I, I like this from, from HRS. Uh, it's a nice um, summary of things to look at specifically after an AFib ablation. So chest pain, you know, and back pain, et cetera. The one things that are different you'll see here if it's, uh, is pulmonary vein stenosis. Okay, so pulmonary vein stenosis, you'll see it come up here for chest pain, for cough, um, and uh, hemoptysis, you might see it as well, pulmonary vein stenosis. So that's if we had burn or, or, or if we froze too close at pulmonary vein. I want to say it's next to non-existent now because we've learned to burn and freeze very antral or away. But the way you diagnose is that a chest CT. And so that's one thing specific to pulmonary vein uh, or AFib ablation to think about that might be different than the normal stuff like tamponade, pericarditis, things like that. The other one that's very unique, and I'm glad it's highlighted here, specifically for cryoablation, for some reason, you know, the um, collateral damage, we call it, outside of the endocardium in the pulmonary veins, patients get a cough, they get the irritation. Uh, and so, um, you, know, you know, just think about that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the suggested evaluations are over here. And then the third one that I want to mention that knock on wood, we haven't had, and I don't think anyone's had one for a long time, but it could happen, is when we're burning or freezing uh, behind 
the left atrium. The left atrium is a posterior structure. And guess what's right behind it? So that's the esophagus. And, um, you know, we monitor temperatures in the esophagus, but an atrioesophageal fistula is life-threatening. Um, suspicion should be there for dysphagia, atrioesophageal fistula for fever, and then neurologic symptoms too, because they could be having systemic emboli, right? So atrioesophageal fistula, stuff from the esophagus going to the rest of the body. It's basically a highly fatal disease um, and is extremely rare, but what you don't want to do is miss the opportunity to identify it by CT scan and call your proceduralist. Do not do a TEE to look for it. Um, the only other thing I want to mention is uh, sometimes actually patients can have vague, long lasting vagal effects. We actually intentionally, as part of our ablation, look for autonomic denervation type responses. And sometimes it can really last uh, and uh, extraordinarily long. So gastric denervation is one that's important. Um, one specific one, I don't know if they mentioned it on here for shortness of breath. Uh, and they do mention it, is phrenic nerve injury. So that, especially in our experience, has been there for, for cryoablation. On the right side, more common than left. If a patient is short of breath, has had cryoablation, um, you do an x-ray, just look for that hemidiaphragm, or if they really are short of breath, do an intentional sniff test to, uh, to look for that um, paralysis, hemiparalysis. So that can be there as well. I don't think I missed anything um, significant here, except, um, well, if I did, hopefully, hopefully you have a chance to read this, but I think those are the most common ones for, um, for um, uh, AFib ablation. Okay, so let's get into some scenarios and then we're almost done here. Let me do a time check and I am still okay. Uh, this patient comes in with symptomatic bradycardia. Uh, they, they consult you, so what do you do? Uh, I'm sorry, after they have their pacemaker and they have some swelling, I'm going to go through this one quickly because I don't have a picture, picture. You palpate it. It's not that swollen. You say basically that this one is no fluctuance. There's no bleeding from the site and it's post-op edema. So not every device needs antibiotics. There's post-op edema. It's fine. Mechanical compression and ice packs. Let's go through this one, which will make sense because I want to go through something else real quick. Patient after a device is hypotensive. What's your differential? Right away, everyone thinks tamponade. Don't forget pneumothorax and bleeding. Um, and your other causes of hypotension too. You all are closer to medicine than we are. And uh, drug reactions, allergic reactions, um, other, you know, other reasons a patient can be hypotensive. It still happens to patients with, with uh, devices. And so what are your next steps? Um, you know, examine the patient, do a bedside echo to confirm. You all now are good with those bedside echo um, things, which I'm terrible at. Um, a chest x-ray can look for cardiomegaly. And, you know, you're going to get better at this than me at identifying. In fact, this one, you can see there's some stranding already. So that's the issue about reversing anticoagulation if they're, in anticoagul if they're anticoagulated. So... Uh, we talked about how to treat this. Um, so based on this, you diagnose an effusion, um, you give them fluids, pericardiocentesis, call the uh, surgeon. After you do that, you know, then you actually have to um, interrogate the device. Um, now, um, I think I'm going to go to the next scenario, right? We've talked about this quite a bit. Um, here's one where a patient has um, complete heart block and they've lost capture, right, on their device. So we went through this, the differential is lead dislodgement. It could be that the uh, lead was, misplacement wasn't put in the right place to begin with. Uh, and we'll actually talk about that. It could be that there's edema, or it could be that when we, when we tighten these headers, we screw it in, that there's a loose set screw. So what is your next step? Temporary pacing. And we're gonna get into that. A chest X-ray, interrogate the device, we talked about increase the pacing amplitude uh, to see if you can improve capture and then a transvenous pacemaker if you need it. So this is normal pacing, left bundle branch block, and you can see in normal QRS, what does this one look like? 
right bundle branch block, right? So what if this patient was losing capture, what happened? You might say they perforated into the LV. More common than not, if you look at this course of this lead, it's loop-de-loop, -loop, which is not that big a deal, but the problem is, is where it's looped is that's going towards the back here uh, and into the uh, middle cardiac vein. Um, okay, um, now you have a patient, uh, same patient, so you increase the output because they had a high threshold. It shows that the x-ray had an abnormal course and it went into the coronary sinus. Um, this is a bonus question. Medtronic will look like there's a loss of capture. Read about MVP and all, uh, they're the only company that will intentionally allow a beat to drop so that the patient can have their own intrinsic conduction uh, you know, down the road. Um, so it doesn't always mean there's a problem. Read about Medtronic MVP. Um, I really want to finish with this, I think, which is how to do emergency pacing. Believe it or not, I have seen scenarios in our hospital where folks have had a hard time pacing from the defibrillator pads. And the reason why is that even a defibrillator can be programmed to fix or demand and on a defibrillator pad or a transcutaneous pacing, if you don't have limb leads connected to the patient and you try to pace from the pads in demand, it won't pace because it doesn't see an EKG. So just learn how to change a device to an asynchronous mode. And I think this video, imagine a patient right now is in asystole, okay? So I'm calm right now and I'm turning it over to pacing, you would turn, we have Phillips here, so I don't know what you have at your hospitals, but this is true for Medtronic and Zoll, I need to check with as well. So I push start pacing, and you can see it says demand mode, and it's not pacing. And here it says, check your EKG leads, right? Um, and it's not pacing. So I go back in and I check, why is it not pacing? Start pacing is not working. Start pacing is not working, right? The output, it doesn't work. So you have to go to menu. You have to go to demand. You have to go to mode. You have to get to check. You got to change it from demand to fix. Hit check. Remember, the patient's name is the link. Hit start pacing. Boom. Pacing spikes. And we're all good. So how did I do that? I'll send this out to Stacey. Um, if you've got these uh, pacing pads, uh, these types of defibrillators at your place, please learn how to do this. It goes through the keys of going to the pacer, you know, changing it from demand mode to fixed mode, right? Don't even think about pushing that sync button up there because this is not to change the pacing mode. This is sync for the defibrillator. So you gotta go to the menu and go through that. So I'm going to um, skip these in the interest of time because I can send that out to you. Um, so please, please learn how to do that with all your companies. And if you can convince the company uh, to program it default to fixed mode, I highly recommend that. Philips has not agreed to do that. Medtronic can do that. And again, I need to check with Zolt. So in conclusion, um, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, complications are rare, but you as a cardiology fellow will see almost all of them. Uh, so know not just how to recognize and treat, but when to ask for help. Um, it's okay if you aren't sure. I just told you right now when I was preparing these slides, I literally pulled my EP fellow in to say, this is the pneumo, right? Uh, because we don't see a lot of them. And it was an unusual location. So it's okay to ask for help. And don't forget the basics from internal medicine. To this day, the rhythm that scares me the most in EP is sinus tachycardia because it's something I can't shock, I can't ablate and the patient's telling you something's wrong. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, best of luck. Uh, these are some of my um, cartoon character uh, colleagues here at Kaiser Los Angeles. Best of luck to all of you. Um, wish you the best. Bye-bye.